All right, guys, let's continue. Uh, chapter 6, Part 6. All that evening until 10 o'clock, he spent in various inns, dives, going from one to the other. Somewhere along his way, Gatia had appeared again, singing another manservant's ditty about how somehow a villain and a tyrant had begun to kiss Katya. Zvidrelgov had been burying, or Zvidrelgov had been buying drinks for Katya, the boy organ player, the male singers and the serving staff, as well as for two wretched little government scribes. The real reason he had had anything to do with these scribes was that they both had crooked noses. The nose of one was bent to the right, while that of the other was bent to the left. This had impressed Virelgov. They had finally lured him into some kind of pleasure garden where he had paid for their drinks as well as supplying the money for the entrance fee. The garden contained one scraggy fir tree of some three years growth and three shrubs. In addition to this, a vox hall had been built, really just an open-air drinking den, but there it was also possible to obtain tea, and there were, moreover, one or two green tables and chairs. A chorus of inferior singers and some sort of inebriated Munich German who looked like a circus clown with a red nose but somehow extremely sad were trying to entertain the audience. The scribes got into a quarrel with some other scribes and had been on the point of fighting. Fedorogov was chosen to be their judge. This function he had carried out for a quarter of an hour, but they shouted so much that there had not been the slightest chance of making any sense of the matter. The only certainty that transpired was that one of them had stolen something and had actually sold whatever it was to some Jew who had, who had turned up, but having sold it, would not share the proceeds with his companion. The stolen object finally proved to be a teaspoon belonging to the Vauxhall. Its absence was noted in the Vauxhall and the matter began to assume troublesome proportions. Vidrelgov had paid for the spoon, got up, and left the garden. By that time, it was about six o'clock. He himself had not drunk one drop of alcohol during all this time, and while they had been in the Vauxhall, had ordered only tea, and that more for reasons of propri propriety than anything else. Meanwhile, a murky, oppressive evening worn on. Towards ten o'clock, fearsome thunderclouds moved in from all sides. There was a crack of thunder, and the rain came sluicing down like a waterfall the water did not fall in drops but last the earth in cascading spurts every moment or so there were flashes of lightning and one could count up to five in each of them wet to the skin he went back to his rooms locked himself in opened the writing desk took out all his money and tore up two or three documents then stuffing the money in his pocket he began to change his clothes but looking out of the window and listening to the rain and thunder took his hat and went out Leaving his rooms unlocked, he went straight along to Sonia's. She was back. She was not alone. Around her were four small children of Kapernamov. Sofia Semyonova was giving them tea. She greeted Zvidrelgov in deferential silence, eyed his, eyed his drenched clothing with surprise, but said not a word. The children all instantly ran away in indescribable terror. Zvidrelgov took a seat at the table and asked Sonia to sit down beside him. She timidly made ready to listen. Sofia, it's possible that I may be leaving for America, Zvidrelgov said, and since this is probably the last time we shall see each other, I have come to make certain arrangements. Well, so you saw that lady today. I know what she said to you. There's no need to repeat it. Sonia began to make emotion and blushed. These people have a certain cast of mind. As regards your small sisters and brother, they really have been provided for, and the money that is due to them has been entrusted for each of them. Under signature, into safe hands in the proper quarters. Actually, I think you ought to take these signed receipts and keep them just in case. Here, take them. Well, then that's that. Here are three 5% bonds worth 3,000 rubles in all. I want you to take these for yourself, solely for yourself, and let it be agreed between us that no one shall know of it. Whatever may come to your ears later on, this money will be necessary to you because, Sofia, to live as you have been living is not seemly, and in any case now, you have no need to do so. I'm so much in your debt, sir, and and so are my orphans and my dead stepmother, Sonia said hurriedly, that if I haven't thanked you properly, you mustn't think, oh, there, there, that will do. But you know, Arkady, Ivan, but you know, Arkady Ivanovich, this money, I'm very grateful to you, of course, but I really don't need it now. If I have only myself to support, I can always do that. Please don't think me ungrateful. If you want to be really generous, then you should use this money too. To give to you, to you, Sofia, and please take it without too many words, because I really haven't the time. 
You're going to need it. Rodion Romanovic has two roads open to him, either a bullet in the forehead or Vladimirka. Sonia gave him a wild look and began to tremble. Don't worry, I know it all. I've heard it from his own lips and I'm not a gossip. I shan't tell anyone. That was sensible advice you gave him that, that time, when he told him to go and give himself up. It'll be far more advantageous to him. Well, if it turns out to be Vladimirka, he'll go off there and you'll follow him, I expect. That's right, isn't it, isn't it? Well, and if that's the case, then you really will need the money. You'll need it for him. Do you see what I mean? I'm giving it to you. I'll also be giving it to him. What's more, you've promised Amalia Ivanovna to pay her the money she's owed. I mean, I heard you say you would. Why do you take all these contracts and obligations onto your shoulders in such an ill-considered manner? Sofia Semyonova. After all, it was Katarina Ivanovna who owed the money to that German woman, not you. So you wanted to give a spit for the German woman. You won't make your way in the world if you carry on like that. Well, if anyone should ask you, oh, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, if you see me or have any information about me and ask you, and ask you they will, then please don't mention that I paid this visit to you and, un and under no circumstances showed the money to anyone or tell them I gave it to you. Well, goodbye now. He got up from his chair. Give my greetings to Rodion Romanich. Oh, and by the way, if I were you, I'd give that money to Mr. Razumikin to look after for the time being. You know Mr. Razumikin, don't you? Of course you do. He's not a bad sort of fellow, so take it to him tomorrow or when the time comes. And until then, hide it somewhere, far from prying eyes. Sonia also leaped up from her chair, and she looked at him in fear. She wanted very much to say something, ask a certain question, but in those first few moments, she did not dare to begin it, and indeed did not know how to. You're not, you're not going out in the rain like that, are you, sir? I say, it's not much good a chap sitting off for America if he's afraid of the rain. He, he, he. Goodbye, Sofia Semyonova, my dear. Live and live long. You'll stand others in good stead. And before I get, and before I forget, please tell Mr. Razumikin that I bowed to him. Put it in just those words. Say, Arkady Ivana, Ivanovich Zvidrelgov bows to you. Be sure you get it right. He went out, leaving Sonia in a state of bewilderment, fear, and a kind and a kind of dark, vague suspicion. It turned out later that on this same evening, at about midnight, he had made yet another highly eccentric and unexpected visit. The rain had still not stopped. At twenty minutes to twelve, wet all over, he had gone on foot to the cramped little apartment that belonged to the parents of his fiancée and was situated on Vasily Island. In the third line on... Mali Prospect. He had to do a great deal of knocking before they opened up and was initially the cause of a major commotion. But Arkady Ivanovich could, when he wanted to, be a man of the most charming manners with the result that the original, though it must be confessed thoroughly astute sus supposition of the fiancé's parents that Arkady Ivanovich must somewhere on his route have drunk himself into a condition of such intoxication that he no longer knew what he was doing, was instantly confounded. The enfeebled Progen, progenitor was wheeled through in his armchair to see Ar Arkady Ivanovich by the fiancé's wise and soft-hearted mother, who, following her custom, immediately began to ask all sorts of roundabout questions. This woman never asked her questions in a straightforward manner, but would invariably start the ball rolling first with smiles and the rubbing of hands, and then, if it was really quite essential to ascertain something indefinite, unambiguous terms, for example, when was Arkady Ivanovich going to fix a date for the wedding, would it begin with the most inquisitive and almost avid questions about Paris and the court life there, and only then arrive in accordance with procedure at the third line of Vasily Island. At any other time, all this would, of course, have aroused great respect, but on the present occasion, Ark Arkady Ivanovich appeared for some reason to be exceptionally impatient curtly demanding to see his fiancée even though he had already been informed at that very outset that his fiancée had gone to bed. It need hardly be said that the fiancée made her appearance. Arkady Ivanovich told her straight out that because of something extremely important that had come up, he was compelled to travel away from St. Petersburg for a time, and had therefore brought her 15,000 silver rubles and bonds and credit notes of various kinds, asking her to accept them from him as a present and saying that he had long intended to give her this trifle before the wedding. His explanations in no way manifested any particular logical connection between his imminent departure and the gift or the urgent necessity of his coming to present or of his coming to present it to them at midnight in the pouring rain, but even so the whole thing went off quite smoothly. Even the indispensable sighs and exclamations, the questions and expressions of surprise suddenly became unusually muted and restrained. 
On the other hand, however, gratitude of the most ardent kind was displayed and was also lent forth by the tears of that wisest of mothers. Arkady Ivanovich got up, laughed, kissed his fiancée, patted her on the cheek, assured her he would be back soon, and, noticing in her eyes not only a certain childish curiosity, but also a very earnest, unspoken question, thought for a moment, gave her another kiss, and as he did so, ex experienced a pang of sincere regret within his soul that the gift would immediately be placed under lock and key for safekeeping by that wisest of mothers. He went out, leaving them all in a thoroughly excited condition. But the soft-hearted mama instantly, in a semi-whispered patter, solved some of the more taxing riddles by declaring that Arkady Ivanovich was an important man, a man of business and connections, a wealthy man. Heaven only knew what was on his mind. He had decided something and set off. His decision had led him to part with all that money, and consequently there was no cause for wonder. It was, of course, strange his being so wet, but if one considered the English, for example, they were even more eccentric, and in any case, none of these society people paid any attention to what was said about them. It was even possible that he went around like that on purpose in order to show that he was not afraid of anyone. The main thing was, however, that they should not tell anyone about all this because heaven only knew what might happen to them. Or because heaven only knew what might happen then, and the money must be immediately placed under lock and key. And of course, the best thing about it all was that Fedosia had been sitting in the kitchen and not on any, any, any account must they breathe the word of it to that old vixen Reslich, and so on and so forth. They sat up whispering until about two o'clock. The fiancé, however, went back to bed much earlier, astonished and a little sad. Fedrogov, meanwhile, was, on the very stroke of midnight, crossing Blank Kav Bridge towards the St. Petersburg side. The rain had stopped, but there was a roaring wind. He was beginning to shiver, and for a single moment, he looked at the black water of the little Neva with a kind of a special curiosity. Standing there above the water, however, he soon began to feel very cold. He turned around and walked over to Blank, o blank Oi Prospect. He strode along the endless Blank Oi Prospect for a very long time, almost half an hour, several times losing his foothold in the darkness on the wooden paving slabs, but never once giving up his search for something on the right-hand side of the street. Somewhere along here at the end of the street, he had, he had, while passing, recently noticed a hotel which, although built of wood, was quite a large one. Its name, as far as he could remember, was something like the Adrianopolis. He had not been out in his reckonings. In a, God in a God forsaken district like this, the hotel was such an evident landmark that it was quite impossible not to see it even in the darkness. It was a long, blackened wooden building in which the late hour, notwithstanding, lights were still burning. The place appeared to be quite busy. He went inside and asked the tagam he went inside and asked the ragamuffin who met him in the passage for a room. After giving Zred Rogoff a quick look up and down, the ragamuffin shook himself into life and instantly led him off to a distant room. Stuffy and narrow, somewhere right at the end of the passage in a corner under the staircase, this was the only room to be had. All the others were occupied. The ragamuffin gave him an inquiring look. Do you serve tea? he asked. All right, guys, we're continuing on Crime and Punishment. Part 6, Chapter 6. So he asked, do you serve tea? I believe this is Ar Arkady Ivanovich Vidrelgov. I think he's still, he's still in this scene. So the guy responds, yes, sir. And Vidrelgov asks, what food have you got? There's veal, sir, vodka, sir, zakuski, sir. Bring me tea and some veal. You don't want anything else? The ragamuffin asked in positive bewilderment. No, that's all, that's all. The ragamuffin went off thoroughly disappointed. This must be a good place, Zvidrelgov thought. How is it I didn't know about it? I probably also looked like someone who was on his way back from a cafe, Chantant, but got involved in some episode en route. In any case, it would be interesting to find out who's staying here and spending the night. He lit a candle and examined the room in more detail. It was a little cell, so tiny that Zvidrelgov almost had a stoop in it. With one window, the bed was very dirty. A simple painted chair and table took up almost all the remaining space. The walls looked as though they had been knocked together out of boards, covered in shabby wallpaper so dusty and tattered that while it was still possible to guess its color yellow, none of the pattern could be deciphered at all. 
One portion of the wall and the ceiling had been cut obliquely, as is usually done in attic rooms, but above this sloping portion ran the staircase. Svidrelgov put the candle down, seated himself on the bed, and began to ponder. But a strange and ceaseless whisper, which was coming from the cell next door, and sometimes rose almost to a cry, at last drew his attention. This whisper had been going on incessantly ever since he had come in. He listened somehow. He listened. Someone was shouting at someone else and reproaching whoever it was almost in tears, but only one voice was audible. So that Relgoff got up, shielded the candle with his hand, and in the wall a chink of light instantly appeared. He stepped over to it and began to look. In a room that was slightly larger than his own, there were two male guests, one of them in his shirt sleeves, his head covered in abundant curls, and his face red and inflamed, stood in the pose of an orator. His legs splayed apart in order to keep his balance, beating his breast. He was reproaching the other in emotional tones for the fact that he was destitute and did not even possess a civil service rank, that he had dragged him out of the mire and could tell him to go any time he felt like it, and that all this was being witnessed by none but the finger of the Almighty. The companion who was the object of these reproaches was sitting on a chair and had the look of a man who badly wanted to sneeze but could not for the life of him do so. From time to time he gazed at the orator with a sheep-like and luck-luster stare, but he evidently had not the slightest conception of what it was all about, and it was doubtful whether he could even hear any of it. A guttering candle stood on the table together with an almost empty decanter of vodka, vodka glasses, a loaf of bread, tumblers, cucumbers, and a tea service, the tea in which had long ago been drunk. Having given this scene his careful scrutiny, Svidrelgov indifferently moved away from the chink and sat down again on the bed. The ragamuffin who had returned with the tea and veal could not resist asking once more whether he wanted anything else, and, on again receiving a negative reply, beat a definitive retreat. Svidrelgov fell upon the tea in eagerness, anxious to warm himself, and drank a glass of it, but was unable to eat a single morsel as he had completely lost his appetite. He was showing clear signs of incipient feverishness. He took off his overcoat and jacket, wrapped himself up in a blanket, and lay down on the bed. He was annoyed. It would have been better not to be ill on this occasion at least, he thought, and smiled a sardonic smile. The room was airless. The candle was burning dimly. The wind roared outside. Somewhere in a corner, a mouse was scrabbling, and the whole place seemed to have a reek of mice and of something leathery. He lay and seemed to lose himself in reverie, thought followed thought, thought followed thought. It seemed to him that he would very much like to have been able to fix his imaginings on some one thing in particular. There must be trees that are making that roaring noise. How I detest the roaring of trees at night, in darkness and storm. A horrible sound. He remembered how, as he had made his way earlier past Petrovsky Park, he had thought about it with positive loathing. That reminded him of blank cov bridge in the little in the little neva and again he found himself feeling cold as he had done earlier standing above the water i've never ever cared for water not even in the landscapes not even in landscapes he thought and he suddenly smiled his sardonic smile again as a certain curious thought occurred to him i mean all those questions of aesthetics and comfort ought into matter a damn to me now. Yet lo and behold, I'm as choosy as a wild animal selecting a place for itself in a similar situation. I should have taken the turning into Petrovsky Park back earlier. It must have seemed too dark and cold at the time. He he. I was hurriedly, I was hardly in need of agreeable sensations. Speaking of which, why don't I douse the candle? He blew it out. Those characters next door have gone to bed, he thought, no longer seeing any light in the chink he had peeped through just now. You know, Marfa Petrovna, this would be a good time for you to come visit me. It's dark, the place is eminently suitable, and the moment quite inspired, and yet you won't do it. For some reason, he suddenly recalled how earlier that day, an hour before carrying out his plan concerning Dunya, he had told Raskolnikov he thought it would be a good thing if he were to entrust her to the care of Razumikin. I probably said that just to give myself a cheap thrill, as Raskolnikov guessed, but that Raskolnikov's a scoundrel. He's got a lot on his conscience. He may eventually become a proper scoundrel when he's put all the nonsense behind him. But for the present, he's far too fond of life. As far as that point's concerned, that crowd are bastards. Well, let the devil do with them as he pleases. It's no business of mine. 
He was still unable to get to sleep. Little by little, the image of Dunya, as he had seen her earlier, began to rise up before him, and suddenly a shiver passed through his body. No, I must forget about that now, he thought, re regaining clarity for a moment. I must think about something else. It's a strange and ludicrous fact that I'm never that I've never felt any great hatred for anyone, never even wanted to take my revenge, and I mean that's a bad sign, a bad sign. Neither have I ever been given to argument or losing my temper. That's another bad sign. All those things I was promising her earlier, the devil take it. But after all, perhaps she'd have made a new man of me somehow. He fell silent again and gritted his teeth. Again, the image of Dunya appeared before him exactly as she had been when, having fired her first shot, she had suddenly been horribly afraid, had lowered the revolver and looked at him in such numb immobility that he would have had time to assault her twice without her so much as raising a hand in her own defense, had he not suggested it to her himself. He remembered how in that instant he had felt sorry for her, felt as though his heart would break. Ach, to the devil. The same thoughts again. I must forget, forget all that. By now he was beginning to lose consciousness. The fevered shivering had subsided. Suddenly he felt something ran under the blanket and crossed his arm and leg. He gave a violent shudder. The devil damn me if that's not a mouse, he thought. I've left the veal out on the table. The last thing he wanted was to take off the blanket, get up and feel cold. But again, something unpleasant suddenly fluttered across his leg. He tore the blanket from him and lit the candle. Shaking with feverish cold, he stooped down to examine the bed. There was nothing. He gave the blanket a shake, and suddenly a mouse leaped out of it onto the sheet. He lunged at it in an attempt to catch it, but the mouse did not leave the bed. Flickered zigzags in all directions, slipped from under his fingers, ran across his hand, and suddenly ducked away under the pillow. He turfed the pillow off, but instantly felt something slither onto his chest and then flit across his midriff and down his back under his shirt. He gave a nervous spasm and woke up. The room was in darkness. He was lying on the bed, still huddled in the blanket as he had been before, and the wind was howling outside the window. What a revolting business, he thought with annoyance. He got up and sat himself on the edge of the bed with his back to the window. It's better if I don't try to sleep at all, he decided. A cold, damp stream of air was coming from the window, however, without raising himself from the spot. He drew the blanket over him and swathed himself in it. As for the candle, he did not light it. He was not thinking about anything, nor did he want to think. But waking dreams rose one, rose up one after another. Waking dreams. Fragments of thought went flickering past without beginning end or anything to connect them. He seemed to fall into a semi-slumber. It might have been the cold, the gloom, the dampness, the wind that was howling outside the window and making the trees uh, sway. All of these combined, evoking in him an intense predisposition towards the fantastic and a desire for it. But whatever the reasons was, he kept seeing flowers. He imagined a charming landscape, a bright, warm, almost hot day, a feast day, wit Sunday, a splendid, luxurious rural cottage in the English style, grown all around with frag fragrant banks of flowers planted with flower beds that pass right round the whole building a porch wound round with climbing creepers and crammed on every side with beds of roses a bright cool staircase covered with a splendid carpet and bedecked with rare flowers and chinese vases he took particular notice of the vases and the windows containing water and bunches of white and tender narcissi inclining on their long bright green succulent stems giving off a strong aromatic odor he felt positively reluctant to leave them, but he climbed the staircase and entered a large, high-ceiling reception room, and here again, everywhere, by the windows near the doors that were open onto the terrace, on the terrace itself, everywhere there were flowers. The floors had been strewn with freshly scythed, fragrant grasses. The windows were open, fresh, cool, light air filtered into the room. Birds, birds chirruped outside the windows, and in the middle of the room, on some tables covered with white satin shrouds, stood a coffin. This coffin was wrapped in white grove de Naples, white gross de Naples, and trimmed with a thick white ruche, R U C H E. Garlands of flowers entwined it from every side. Covered in flowers, a young girl lay in it, dressed in a white tulle dress, her arms folded together and pressed to her bosom, as though they had been sculpted from marble. But her unbanded hair, the hair of a light blonde, was wet. A wreath of roses entwined her head. The unyielding and already stiffened profile of her face also seemed sculpted from marble, but the smile on her pallid lips was full of an unchildlike and limitless sorrow and a great complaining lament. Svirogov knew what this girl was 
So the Relgoth knew what this girl was. There were no icons or lighted candles beside this coffin. This girl was a suicide. She had drowned herself. She was only 14 years old, but this was a heart already broken, and it had destroyed itself, insulted by a humiliation that had ter insulted by a humiliation that had terrified and astonished this young child's consciousness and had flooded her angelically pure soul with shame, tearing from her a last final shriek of despair that was not heated but brazenly cursed on a dark night in the murk, in the cold, in the damp thaw weather when the wind was howling. Vidrelgoff recovered his wits, got up from the bed, and strode over to the window. He found the bolt by Phil and opened the window. The wind lashed violently into his cramped little closet and covered his face and his chest, which was protected by nothing more than his shirt, with something that felt like a hoar frost. There must really be something resembling a garden outside the window, and it was probably a pleasure garden at, at that. There, too, the Pazaniki sang and tea was served around the tables. Now, however, droplets of rain were being whirled off the trees and bushes. It was a dark, it was as dark as a vault, so dark that one could only make out a few dim patches that denoted objects. Svirelgaf, leaning down and propping his elbows on the windowsill, continued to stare into this gloom for about another five minutes without interruption. In the midst of the blackness and night, a cannon shot detonated, followed by another. Aha, the flood warning. The water's rising, he thought. By morning, it will be rushing through the streets in the lower lying parts of town. It will wash into basements and cellars. The cellar rats will come floating up and out in the wind and rain. People will start. And out in the wind and rain, people will start cursing and wet to drag what remains of their possessions up to the higher stories. But what time is it now? No sooner had he thought this than somewhere near to hand tickling and seeming to hurry with all its might a wall clock struck three my god it will be light in an hour what's the point in waiting i'll go now straight to petrovsky park i'll pick out a large bush somewhere in there one that's completely saturated in rain so that one only has to brush it the merest bit with one's sh um, shoulder to send a million droplets pouring all over one's head he stepped away from the window bolted it lit the candle pulled on his waistcoat and overcoat pulled on his waistcoat and overcoat put on his hat and went out, holding the candle into the passage in order to track down the ragamuffin who would be asleep in some little closet somewhere amidst all kinds of old junk and candle ends to pay him for the room and to leave the hotel. It's the best moment one can imagine. None better could exist. For what seemed an age, he made his way through the long, narrow passage without finding anyone and was on the point of giving a loud shout when suddenly in a dark corner, between an old cupboard and a door, he made out a strange object that appeared to be alive. He stooped down with the candle and saw a child, a little girl of about five, no more in a little dress that was sopping wet as a floor rag, shivering and weeping. She did not appear to be afraid of Vidrelgoff, but was looking at him with a dull astonishment in her large black eyes, uttering a sob now and then the way children do when they have been crying for a long time, but have now stopped and are almost consoled. Though the slightest little thing will suddenly make them sob again, the girl's little face was pale and exhausted. She was stiff with cold. How had she got here? She must have been hiding here and had not been to bed all night. He began to ask her questions. The little girl suddenly livened up and babbled something to him very fast in her child's language. There was something about Mumsy and that Mumsy come and smack me about some cup that had been sashed, smashed. The little girl went on talking incessantly. Little by little, it was possible to deduce from all her stories that this was an unloved child whose mother, doubtless some perpetually drunken cook from this very same hotel, had given a drubbing and frightened out of her wits that the little girl had broken a cup of her mother's and been so frightened that she had run away the previous evening. She had probably hidden out in the yard in the pouring rain and finally found her way in here, concealed herself behind the cupboard and remained sitting in this corner all night, weeping, shivering with the damp darkness and the fear that she would now be sorely beaten for all this. He picked her up, carried her back to his room, put her on the bed and began to take her clothes off. Her tattered shoes, which she was wearing on barefoot, were as wet as though they had, they had lain all night in a puddle. Having undressed her, he put her inside the sheets, covered her, and tucked her up in a blanket so that not even her head was visible. She fell asleep instantly. This accomplished, This accomplished, he again fell into gloomy thought. What on earth am I getting myself mixed up in, he decided suddenly with a leaden sense of rancor. Just a lot of nonsense. Irritably, he picked up the candle in order to go out and this time track down the ragamuffin no matter what and get out of his place and 
and get out of this place as soon as possible. Ah, but the kid, he thought with an oath, as he was opening the door and went back to look at the little girl again and see whether she was asleep, and if so, how soundly. Cautiously, he raised the blanket a small way. The little girl was soundly and blissfully asleep. The blanket had made her warm, and the color had spread across her pale cheeks. But there was something strange. This color was more livid and more powerful than any ordinary child's flush. It must be a feverish flush, Virogov thought. It's like the way they look when they've been given a whole glass of wine to drink. Her little scarlet lips seem to be burning, blazing. But what's this? He suddenly fancied that the long black lashes of one of her eyes were quivering and blinking, that they were being raised, and that from under them a sly, sharp little eye was peeping out, winking in a most unchildlike fashion as though the little girl were not asleep but only pretending. Yet he was right. Her lips were parting in a smile. The corners of them were twitching as though she were trying to restrain herself. But now she had abandoned all restraint. This was laughter, open laughter, something insolent and provocative shown in that not at all childlike face. This was lust. This was the face of a dame, the insolent face of a dame, ox, camellias. There, without any attempt at concealment now, both eyes had opened. They were studying him up and down with the burning and shameless gaze. They were inviting him, laughing. There was something infinitely monstrous and outrageous in that laughter, in those eyes, and all this filth in the countenance of a child. What? A five-year-old? Zvidrogov whispered a genuine horror. What? What on earth is this? But there she was, turning her scarlet, burning gaze full on him now, stretching her arms out. Ha! Curse one! Zvidrogov exclaimed in horror, raising his hand above her. But at the very moment, he woke, the same moment he woke up, he was still in the same bed, still swathed in the blanket. The candle was out, and full daylight showed white in the window. Nightmares all night, he sat up with resentment, feeling totally shattered. His limbs ached. Outside, there was a very thick mist, and nothing could be seen. It was about six o'clock. He slept too long. He got up and put on his jacket and overcoat, which were still damp, feeling in his pocket for the revolver. He took it out and adjusted the remaining cap, then he sat. He sat down, took a notebook from his pocket, and on his first page, where they would be most noticeable, wrote a few lines in large characters. When he had read them over, he began to ponder, leaning his elbow on the table. The revolver and the notebook lay there by his elbow. The flies, disturbed from their slumber, crawled slowly over the untouched portion of veal that also lay on the table. For a long time, he gazed at them and then finally began the attempt to catch one of them with his right hand. Again, for a long time, he exhausted himself in these efforts, but could not catch it for the life of him. At last, catching himself at this interesting occupation, he recovered his wits, shuddered, stood up, and walked decisively walked decisively out of the room. A moment later, he was out in the street. A thick, milky fog lay over the city. Zvidrogov made his way along the dirty, slippery wooden pavement in the direction of the Little Neva. In his mind, he saw the waters of the Little Neva swollen overnight, Petrovsky Island, the wet pathways, wet grass, wet trees and bushes, and at last, the very bush. In his irritation, he began to study the buildings in order to have something else to think about. As he walked along the prospect, he encountered neither pedestrians nor cabs. Dirty and forlorn, the bright yellow wooden houses stared with their closed shutters. The cold and damp had chilled his body, and he began to feel feverish. Every so often, he would come across the signs of small stores and green grocers' shops, and he would read each one attentively. Now we had come to the end of the wooden pavement. He was drawing level with a large stone building. A dirty little dog, trembling with cold, its tail between his legs, ran across his tracks. Some man in an overcoat, dead drunk, lay face down across the pavement. Zvidrogov gave him a glance and walked on. A tall watchtower caught his gaze on the left. Ha, he thought, this place will do. Why go to Petrovsky Park? At least I'll have an official witness. He nearly smiled an ironic smile at this new thought and took the turning into blank Skaya Street. There was a large building with a watchtower. Outside the building's large gateway, leaning his shoulder against it, stood a short little man who was muffled up in a gray fireman's overcoat and a brass Achilles helmet. Dozily, he cast a cold and, and disapproving glance at the approaching Zvidrelgov. Manifest on his features was, was that age-old look of querulous sorrow that is so acerbically imprinted on the faces of each member of the Hebrew tribe without exception. For a while, the two of them, Zvidrelgov and Achilles, studied each other in silence. At last, Achilles decided that there was something not quite right about a man who, although not drunk, was standing three paces from him, looking steadily at him and saying nothing at all. Why you here? Vadzu yavant, he said, still without moving a limb or altering his position. 
Oh, nothing, thanks, old chap, Zvidrogov replied. Here is not the place. Actually, old chap, I'm off to foreign parts. Foreign parts? America. America. Zvidrogov took out the revolver and set the trigger. Achilles raised his eyebrows. Why you here? What are you doing? Here is not the place for these jokes. Why is it not the place? Because this is not the place. Well, brother, this is all the same. The place is a good one. If they ask questions, reply that I said I was going to America. He put the revol he put the revolver to his right temple. What's you doing? Here is impossible. Here is not the place. Achilles said, rousing himself and dilating his pupils wider and wider. Zvidrogov pulled the trigger. Damn, Zvidrogov killed himself. That's yeah, crazy. Anyway, uh, that's the end of uh, part six, chapter six.